Hey guys, welcome back. I'm doing another best of 2023 list. Hopefully this one's a little bit more interesting. I don't have that many categories left to go. So these are my top 10 directors of the year. Now I'm doing something right at the top that I should have done before. Points of reference. So last year, my winner for this category was Edward Berger for All Quiet on the Western Front with my runner-up being Guillermo del Toro for Pinocchio. Um... My winner the year before for films for 2021 uh, was actually Ridley Scott for The Last Duel. And my runners-up were Steven Spielberg for West Side Story and John Watts for Spider-Man uh, No Way Home. So, if you want to know sort of how I view things, I like to think of not just the film and its direction and its choices and all of the usual stuff. It's because it's like, how, what is a blind person thinking about with directing? But I also think about um, specifically what is it that this director is bringing to the project? Uh, it's a lot easier for me with directors whose material I've seen before. Um, I, and I don't just mean visually. I mean like anything. Anybody who's ever had a film th that I've watched before. Um, it is easier for me to determine, you know, how much somebody has contributed to a project that way. Uh, and does the, did the project benefit from this director? Was the project made better by having this director on the project? Or could it have been anybody? There are some films where you don't really feel that specific director in the film, where maybe the film directorial choices were not that great, or you know, whatever, um, like, um, Strays. Who directed Strays? Who cares? You know? I don't mean, like, did you like it or not like it? Like, honestly, is there anything about Strays where you're like, oh, I want to see this guy's next project? I like Strays. I don't know who directed it, and it's, it's doesn't, it feels like anybody could have, you know? Um, so it just, there's nothing about that that really pops to me that feels like that was a film that lived and died based on a script, not based on presentation by the director. So I picked 10 directors who I feel like actually did um, make their films better. These are 10 films that I love, loved, I also I liked, loved, loved, liked, loved. I don't know, how do I make that into one word? Make it into one word and then tell me what it is. Um... <laughs> But it's uh, 10 directors who I feel like uh, absolutely had a vision and put that vision on film. So here are my top 10 directors for 2023. With the caveat that I have not seen a couple films with some major directors who could absolutely, absolutely fit the criteria of what I'm talking about with Yorgos Lanthimos, Poor Things, uh, Jonathan Glazer's Zone of Interest, and... Um, Hayao Miyazaki for The Boy and the Heron. So, remember last year, my runner-up was Guillermo del Toro for Pinocchio, so there's no reason to believe that I wouldn't have put Hayao Miyazaki high on my list for an animated feature. Um, it's possible to direct fantastic animated features. We just, at the Oscars, typically ignore that for some <laughs> reason. Anyway, um, my number 10 is Kelly Freeman Craig for Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret. Um, this is a pretty, uh, interesting one because I, I'm using what I know of her from, like, The Edge of Seventeen, and, which is a film I thought was fine. I thought it was a little overpraised. Some people pushing that a little bit too hard on me <laughs> as being, like, the greatest thing since sliced bread. It's not. It's, it's fine. It's fine. Um, but it gave me an idea of what kind of director... Kelly wanted to be, and what she's done with Are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret, uh, I feel like it takes her skills and her ability to direct these coming-of-age stories in meaningful ways uh, without playing down to anybody, without making the kids seem childish or, or dumb, or um, without pushing adults out of the room because it's aimed at a certain audience it feels like it's for everybody 
and it's a very smart uh, script, and it's a very smart direction from her. So, uh, a, a direction that has gone largely unrecognized this year from a film that pretty much everybody liked, from a director that everybody told me they loved their, their first film, so I, and I don't know, don't know why, you know, I don't know what you're doing here. Anyway, so, number 10, Kelly Fremont Craig, uh, for Are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret. Number nine is Ari Aster for Bo is Afraid. Um, uh, yeah, I kind of fought pretty hard with myself to put this here, because uh, Bo is Afraid is not a top 10 film for me. It's not a top 25 film for me. And I, I have problems with it. I have problems with um, the whole Woods segment just didn't work for me. But there's one thing that's that's very evident for me about um, Aster uh, with his body of work. I'm not a fan of Hereditary. I'm not a fan of Midsummer. I actually kind of liked Bo is Afraid. Um, I thought what he did with Bo is Afraid uh, was he used the kind of stuff that he's used to using, the, the tropes that he's bringing into Hereditary and Midsummer to kind of shock and awe. Um, and he brought that into Bo's Afraid, which ended up becoming sort of its own odyssey, uh, like one man's odyssey to get to his mother's funeral that was full of oddities and nightmares, um, and a performance from Joaquin Phoenix that is just, uh, a lot. Um, and it's constantly swinging for the fences. Uh, Ari never rests on his laurels, he never makes a choice uh, he feels like he's always taking the road less traveled. Like, no matter what it is that he's choosing, he's going to choose the other way. Feels like you could put, you know, ten directors in the room and he's the... Uh, and nine out of ten are going to do one thing. He's the, he's the guy who's going to do the other thing. And it doesn't always work in his favor, but it's so refreshing uh, to see him making those choices. And it's refreshing to see him take a little bit of a step away from just straight horror, you know, just nothing but relentless and, and, uh, you know, like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get you with this, you know, it's like, okay, uh, yeah, whatever, um, there are things that I like about certain horror directors that are coming up now, uh, that are around, and it's because they're not doing typical things, and if, Ari can continue to figure out how to do more of this, I think this will benefit him more than just trying to do more of uh, the shock and awe horror uh, that he was doing before. So, um, he does get great performances out of his actors. Uh, I haven't done any acting videos yet, but I promise you there's at least one performance in here that's from Bo is Afraid. So, um, and, uh, yeah, it's odd. It's an odd choice for me because, like I said, it's not in, it's not in my top 25 for the year. So, it's not an honorable mention and it's not in my top 10. So, um, but he is because the vision, uh, came through and, uh, that's what, that's what I liked about it. So, moving up the list, number eight. James Gunn for Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. Um, this may seem like an eye roll for you guys, it, for, especially when you heard me say John Watts was a runner-up for Spider-Man that year. Listen, there were a lot of people who were trying to get Spider-Man in the Best Picture race, so looking back on it, it may seem weird to you now, but if you can remember where we were in 2021 and uh, think to yourself, yeah, that tracks. You know, <laughs> it's just... There was quite a push to try to get that film in the Best Picture race, which means John Watts deserves to come along with it, right? Because he did direct it. Anyway, um, here, James Gunn, it's Guardians. He did all three. Uh, we fought for him to do all three. Disney didn't want him to do all three. <laughs> they tried to cancel him for a tweet that he wrote, like, before they ever hired him to do Guardians of the Galaxy. So, um... Yeah, it's, uh, this is a film that I absolutely believe benefits from its director. If you've ever seen anything that James Gunn has done, he's, uh, he is clearly got, um, a certain style and a certain way of directing, uh, 
a way that he mixes humor with action and also brings in even even though he had he was born sort of out of this the the same horror muck that Ari Aster is coming out of now to try to you know uh, branch into different things um he still wants to find ways of bringing that in through sci-fi elements he wants to find things that that still shock you and there was a lot of that in Guardians of Volume 3 especially regarding the stuff the high executioner was doing with these animals it was you know i mean he gun still finds ways to bring sort of uh scary imagery in um and um sort of things that are horrifying without necessarily us even knowing uh, that they are uh when you think about what's happening to these creatures it's hor it, it is it's terrible um but it's not horror in your traditional sense it's not the same kind of horror that you're gonna run out and you're not gonna compare this with like talk to me uh but james gunn finds a way of bringing that into a pg-13 marvel disney movie um in the pg-13 marvel disney way and i think it's brilliant and guardians is one of my favorite films of the year and um uh james gunn is one of my favorite directors and i think he brought a lot to this project so Moving up the list, number seven, Fennel. Emerald Fennel for Saltburn. Um, again, this uh, Emerald is is uh, doing projects that catch fire. I'll, I'll say that Emerald is picking projects that spark conversation, that are divisive, that. Uh, make choices and Emerald is making a absolute stamp on herself as a director. Um, when you go from Promising Young Woman to Saltburn, those are two films that not everybody loved, but when the people love them, they love them. You know, when you find somebody who loves Saltburn, mm, <laughs> it's like a dog that's like guarding his bowl, you know? Have you ever tried to, like, do anything to a dog while they're eating? It's like, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't, no matter how nice your dog is, don't. Don't fuck with his bowl. <laughs> kind of feels like that with, uh, you know, if you're trying to go at somebody who likes Saltburn. Uh, they're, they're like, don't come at me. Um, and I like Saltburn. And uh, not obsessively, but um, I like the choices that Emerald Fennell uh, makes with Saltburn. I think it's a really well-directed film. It's one of the films with the clearest three-act structure uh of of any film this and oppenheimer probably have the, the three best uh acts structures that you can actually see and feel and and see the shift and be like okay well this was act one this was act two and this was act three um there's a very clear transition between each act and uh it, i i like that she was able to balance and uh, kept everybody waiting. I think one of the things that really benefited Emerald Fennell too was that everybody who saw Saltburn early on talked about how salacious it was from the from the get go. So you're watching the early parts of this, and you're like, "This isn't this isn't salacious. What's going on here? It's happening. It takes a while to get there, you know. I mean, you have to, and then you're like, "Oh, oh, this is it." Um, and it's something that's so funny about how that is what's considered to be salacious nowadays. Like, this is uh, what she has to do. And I feel the same thing about Promising Young Woman. Like, she makes choices in Promising Young Woman that are choices that I feel like she's making so that people will go, ooh, I can't, I can't believe she did that. Um, and it's like, I don't know, have you seen any of the other films this year? Because they're they're doing pretty graphic things also. Um, you know, I mean, is it, is it because she's doing them outside of the horror genre? Is that what's shocking you? <laughs> I don't know. Um, maybe. Uh, but I love Saltburn, and I think Emerald contributed a whole lot to this. And this is exactly what I'm talking about when I say looking at somebody's uh, history in film and seeing could anybody else have made Saltburn? I don't think so. I think it would have dramatically changed the film. There's a lot of what you see happening in Promising Young Woman that makes its way on stage in Saltburn. And um, 
I thought Saw Bomber was exceptional. So, moving up the list. Andrew Haig for All the Strangers. Um, yeah, what a what a film. Uh, I uh, I already picked this this year for Best Adapted Screenplay, so he did win something from me. I don't have trophies, but if Andrew Haig wants to come by, I'll give him a high five. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, All the Strangers to me um, is just such a beautifully directed, impactful film. It has so many great moments. Um, it's interesting how he directs something with such a small cast and makes the most out of it. The, the use of time that he has. Um, if you're, if we're being honest, it's like people are not as interested in the Andrew Scott, Paul Mescal aspect. That's not really the thing that gets people. If it was just that, I don't think this one would be that interesting, but it's how Andrew Scott relates with Claire Foy and Jamie Bell when he goes back to his childhood home and those con conversations that really hit home. Um, but it's how Haig manages to balance that and to continue those conversations and then have Scott go home and we see the evolution of Scott through Paul Mescal and his interactions with Mescal's character. Um, that really helps to sort of give Scott even more dimensions as a character. It's a very nuanced film in many ways, and it's a, uh, it's a conversation piece. It's a film that sadly was not nominated for the Academy Awards this year, uh, and I think that was a mistake, probably more so than anything else. But there's always a film where I just get really angry at the Oscars for not nominating Mass uh, being one of them. I'm still upset that Mass was not nominated. Uh, yeah, anyway... Um, but Andrew Haig, I actually have seen some of his previous work. I've seen Weekend, um, a long time ago. It's funny thinking about Weekend, uh, and how simplistic that film was, and thinking how complex the themes are in All of Us Strangers, and thinking how far Haig has come as a director himself, and, um, but there's still something there. It's like you can feel Weekend in the interactions between Scott and Mescal, but it's like he's added more to it. Uh, like there's more around it now. So he's growing as a director and I'm really excited about that. And I can't wait to see his next project. So anyway, moving up the list. Todd Haynes, Todd Haynes for May, December. Uh, again, this is, if you're familiar at all with Todd Haynes's work, um, one of the things is I've always found his films are visually striking. It's one of the things that as a blind person watching a Todd Haynes film, I'm just a little taken back because I've seen Far From Heaven and Carol. And even though I didn't love Carol, um, there's something about how he directed the shit out of it. You know, he just absolutely like the, the colors, the lights, the costumes, the production design, everything on Carol is flawless. It's just slow for me. It's just not my favorite film. Uh, Far From Heaven is, is, uh, much warmer, uh, in, in many regards, uh, while it still tackles challenging subject matter. And May, December, um, is, you know, he's modernized, he's updated, so he doesn't have the benefit of being able to rely upon costuming from ye olden days, <laughs> Not really that old, but compared to Far From Heaven and Carol. Anyway, uh, yeah, so it's modernized, and he's using a lot of interiors here. Um, and I'm really intrigued by uh, just how he continues to pick subject matter that is um, somewhat subversive, like uh, material that is kind of not the, not the questions that anybody else is asking. And that's what I think that makes this film so uniquely Todd Haynes, is that the through line in Far From Heaven, uh, Carol, and this, and I don't know, like, whatever else he's directed at the same time that I'm not pulling from my memory right now, but just using those films as an example, is there's something that uh, there's a, that you don't want to talk about, that somebody doesn't want to talk about. There's a secret within all of those films, and it's a, but it's a secret that needs to come out. It's a secret... And Todd Haynes is going to be the one to reveal that to you. And that is 
the byline across all those. And uh, I couldn't imagine anybody else directing May, December. And I thought it was really well, well, well directed. And I think it's because Todd Haynes was, was behind it. So May, December makes my list. Moving up the list. Sofia Coppola, Coppola for Priscilla. I think this is the best thing she's done since Lost in Translation, hands down. Um, I loved her interiors. Uh, I loved how she focused solely on Priscilla. Uh, Kaylee Spaney. I, I, this is one where I wish the audio description had just been a little bit better because I actually saw this with a sighted person who was able to tell me sort of a lot of the intentional directorial choices that, that she was making. Like a lot of times um, she kept the, the camera focus on Kaylee Spaney uh, as Priscilla, even if Jacob Elordi as Elvis was talking. And uh, it felt like as a blind person, you're just sitting there listening and you're thinking this is an equal conversation and they're probably framed the way you would normally frame a scene. Uh, there were some times where Jacob would move out of frame or he would not even really be in focus because she was so intently focused on Priscilla. The movie is called Priscilla and by God, she's going to give you Kaylee Spaney's every reaction, every fiber of her being. Um, which actually kind of makes it an impressive performance for Kaylee Spaney because it puts all of the weight on her. Um, but I love that Coppola did that for the direction. I love that she made sort of a minimalist approach to such a gaudy, uh, lifelike personality in uh, Elvis Presley, somebody whose life was always so big. That's what, uh, what worked for Baz Luhrmann's film with Elvis was that it felt like this is the type of person, I just didn't like how he chose to tell it through Tom Parker. Um, but uh, that kind of flash and pizzazz and style works really well for Lerman. Um, here, uh, the minimalist approach done by, Cop by Sofia Coppola on the same wavelength is, uh, I think, why I really think she was the right person and I can't imagine anybody else directing Priscilla. So... Um, it's also her script, so, anyway. Uh, yeah, so, Sofia Coppola for Priscilla makes the cut. I don't know if you've noticed, there are a lot of women on my list. Women did an excellent job in film this year. Uh, moving up the list. Number three on my list is Bradley Cooper for Maestro. Um, this feels like a man who is trying really hard to be taken seriously as a director, is what it feels like. I feel like Bradley directed the ever-loving hell out of Maestro. <laughs> um, I think I like the direction more than I do his performance, and I liked his performance. Um, the choices that he was making, the fact that uh, he he's in every aspect of it. Um, if you like Maestro at all, then you have to like his direction, because... His fingers are everywhere in this. Not only is he on camera, not only is he behind the camera, not only did he write the film and produce the film, he's everywhere. He's just, <laughs> this film, he's like laying on top of this film. Um, and it's the same way uh, with The Star is Born, where he's involved. He doesn't just get like sort of involved in the film. He has to be involved in everything and like the whole, all of it, you know? Um, and... It's his love of, of the craft and the the idea. What I liked about Maestro, uh, in addition to just the, the some of the choices that he made directionally to uh, move us through the time period, stuff that we that again blind people didn't get an audio description, but I do my research. Uh, a lot of those choices that he uses in terms of aspect ratio um, to move us through time periods and and using of colors and. Uh, framing different sequences. All of that is great. I also love the fact that it's a biopic that's not a biopic. Um, and it's it's not all of the moments of Leonard Bernstein's life where he's constantly working with all of the top names, you know, and, oh, this is when he did that great thing that we all remember him for. Oh, this is when he had won that award for this and we're all sitting at the awards ceremony. You know, uh, he didn't shrink Carrie Mulligan's character in this to be a supportive um shadow instead he made this about leonard bernstein's life through his relationship with his wife so all of the stuff 
that you might have seen in a rather traditional biopic was told outside of it. Uh, it, it was told through this narrow window of a relationship and he still managed to pull it off. I think it's very well directed and I respect the hell out of Bradley Cooper and I'm really excited to see what his next project is um, as a result. So um, my runner up of the year is going to blow your mind um, because it means they didn't win. My runner-up for the year is Christopher Nolan for Oppenheimer. Um, my problem with not putting Christopher Nolan at number one is I'm not the Oscars. If I was an Oscar voter this year, I would absolutely be voting for him because he deserves to be an Oscar winner. And I don't trust the Oscars to vote for him again. They've only ever nominated him one time before for Dunkirk, which is gross. He should be nominated multiple times. His trajectory should have looked like his original nomination should have been for Memento. Uh, he should have followed that up with uh, definitely a nomination uh, slash win for The Dark Knight. Uh, possibly also nominations for The Prestige, um, uh, Inception, maybe Interstellar, Dunkirk. You know, I mean, he should be on his sixth or seventh nomination by now. And it, we shouldn't even, he should have already won. So we're not even talking about, oh, should Nolan win the trophy for this film? Uh, he's a little bit, it's a little bit like The Departed. He's winning for what people will not remember as being necessarily his best work. Because it, people will always want him to have won for The Dark Knight. No matter how much you love Oppenheimer right now, I promise you in 10 years, you'll still wish he won an Oscar for The Dark Knight. So, um, it's really hard for me to put that. Uh, I think Oppenheimer is a fantastic film. Uh, just, uh, just an incredible achievement. Um, I love his use of practicality. I love that he, uh, commits to things like, um, shooting on film and, and shooting a black and white IMAX stock, stock. And, uh, I mean, he's one of the last people that's actually sort of forcing people to go to the cinema to experience things in ways that they can't experience it at home. Um, and so much so that he almost radically, uh, scoffs in the face of everything else. He's not a great campaigner for himself because he always ends up insulting some other aspect of Hollywood while he's campaigning and it's a little bit like, I'm better than you. Um, it's like, yeah, I mean, you are, but <laughs> you don't need to tell people that. <laughs> uh, I, he's easily one of my favorite directors. Um, like a, easily like a top five. I don't even have to think to, to be able to make that, that sort of lifelong commitment um, about who would be in my top five, but I know Nolan would be there. Um, there, my least favorite film of his is Tenant, and I gave that, I think, like a B minus. So, uh, like, he's never, I've never scored him below that. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a pretty good, pretty good ratio, and I've seen everything he's done. So, um, yeah, uh, he deserves, absolutely deserves to win the Oscar based on those five nominees. Unfortunately, my person wasn't nominated this year. And, um, what's really funny here is, uh, uh, now that I've, I've talked to you about Nolan and you guys all know, anybody who's listening right now knows why Nolan deserves to, to be on top. And I, it's not that I don't disagree. Um, but a lot of times I look at also, what is the work? How challenging was it? Could anybody else have directed the project? Um, what would it have looked, could it, would it have turned out? And the answer is no. I honestly, truly believe that my winner could not, no one else could have directed this. No one else could have put this together. Odd thing is, I can tell you right now that this is not, that this, that this is one of those years where this is not going to line up. This film is not in my top 10. It's in my honorable mentions. Um, and I do have a couple problems with it, but, uh, there's a one reason why this film worked and that's Greta Gerwig for Barbie is my winner for best director. Um, I literally cannot imagine anyone else directing Barbie and it coming out the way that it did. I don't know who that person would be. Uh, it would be radically different because it would be, it would shape to their style and there's no, there's no guarantee that that film would have grossed a billion dollars at the box office. There's no guarantee that that film, Barbie is a best picture nominee. When you, when you hear those words coming out of your mouth, it sounds weird. You know, it's like, 
I know we're making a Barney movie, but <laughs> if some if if future me time travels back now and tells me that Barney's the best picture nominee, I'm immediately going to want to know who's directing and how they made that happen. Because there's some of these that these projects that just don't seem like they could ever possibly be taken seriously by the Academy. The fact that this film got eight Oscar nominations, including Best Picture, Best Supporting Actor, Best Supporting Actress, Best Adapted Screenplay. What? <laughs> what are we even doing here? Um, I, it's... It, I know that everybody was so upset because they were like, Margot Robbie was snubbed. And I was like, Margot wasn't snubbed. Greta was snubbed. I don't know. Like, I get it. Margot helped to produce. Guess what? She's recognized as a producer. The whole thing that you keep saying the film would have never happened without Margot, she is recognized as a producer in the Best Picture race. <laughs> She got nominated for the exact thing that you're using to try to define as why she should be nominated for Best Actress. However, Greta Gerwig is not nominated for the very thing that she should be nominated, nominated for, which is directing this thing. Which is putting this whole thing together, putting this whole team, you know, shepherding those uh, original songs, which three of them made the shortlist, even though two of them could only get nominated. <laughs> um which is making sure that the the score was great, the production design, the hair and makeup. She had to, she went through every aspect of this. She combed through, she assembled the team. She assembled the Avengers guys, basically, on this. And she didn't just do it and make an entertaining film. This isn't just, she didn't just come along and make something that was critically adored. And we were like, oh, that's that was cute. That was a fun movie. She didn't make Crazy Rich Asians. Which, you know, we were like, mm, maybe Michelle Yeoh will get a Supporting Actress nomination. You know, that was a fun movie. Remember that? Remember, remember, it was like, oh, Crazy Rich Asians was good. No, no, she made a film that people were passionate about getting into the Best Picture race. <laughs> Barbenheimer, billion dollars. Uh, it's absolutely absurd that she's not in the race this year. This isn't even a top ten film for me, but she is clearly my best director of the year. When I started comprising this list and I started asking myself the, the tough questions of, is there anybody who put forth their best work this year, De definitively? And the answer to me was obviously Greta Gerwig. Um, I, I do think that this is better than Little Women and Lady Bird. Uh, I think Lady Bird and Little Women, the stuff that she put forth in that led to uh, Barbie, uh, but it's it's... I mean, the differences here are, you know, it's like she sailed across the ocean twice and, uh, you know, as like the first female captain of a boat and then they gave her the Titanic. But in this world, the Titanic made it. In this world, the Titanic missed the iceberg. You know, everybody thought the Titanic was going to hit the iceberg, but nope, Greta Gerwig was the captain and she got that shit to New York. <laughs> So, uh, that's kind of the achievement, and I think it's being very under, uh, uh, underestimated this year, and Greta Gerwig is my winner for Best Director of 2023. I hope I've made enough of a reasoning for that, that, uh, because Nolan is the easy choice for me. Greta Gerwig, not an easy choice for me, <laughs> in terms of, like, oh, Greta Gerwig's one of my favorite directors of all time. Not really a true statement for me, but um, I, I absolutely uh, believe she was robbed of a nomination. Uh, yeah. So anyway, that's it. Um, thanks for watching, and I'll have another top ten list for you soon. Until then, see you guys on the other side.